ladies and gentlemen. So pleased to welcome you all to our webinar that hosted by Kurdish National Congress of North America. We at KNC delighted to extend a special welcome to our outstanding expert panelists and greatly honored that they are joining us to share their insight and knowledge. And first, I would like to take this opportunity to inform the viewers about the goals of the KNC today. This organization has been serving national cause since 1988 and reaching the voice of the Kurds to North American officials in USA and Canada, to American research and political institutions, and raising awareness of the Kurdish issues and difficulties that they are encountering in all four parts of Kurdistan. And, and a quick uh, highlight on the Southern Kurdistan and uh, Western Kurdistan. So it's Kurdistan of Iraq and Kurdistan of Syria, which are uh, we're discussing today. Uh, today, Kurds are once again at the crosshairs of the regional hegemonic powers' interests. As, the, as these regional powers attempt to carry out their expansionist agenda. In the Kurdistan region of Iraq, Kurds have enjoyed semi-autonomy -autonom with a high degree of success since 1991 and have become more prosperous after the liberation of Iraq by the US-led coalition. In Western Kurdistan, better known as Rojava, the Kurds have made significant gains in liberating their areas from Assad's regime and ISIS. In both, in both of these Kurdish safe enclaves, in which Syria and Iraq are both either weak or failing, Turkey and Iran are taking advantage of this vacuum by expanding their influences with both land grabs and mining activities. Turkey has been violating Iraq and Syrian sovereignty in the name of going after terror groups with air and ground assaults. Iran has been advancing its outreach in Iraq, Syria, and across the region in competition to the Turkish and other regional players. Meanwhile, the two major hegemonic powers, US and Russia, are also in the region and trying to balance the influence of this to regional powers, yet sometimes at the expense of the Kurds. Ladies and gentlemen, today, let's together challenge the theme of our webinar, Kurdistan region in crosshairs of the, of the hegemonic interest with our guests. Uh, our first guest, we're gonna start with uh, Her Excellency, uh, Bayan Sami Abdurrahman. Uh, Bayan Sami Abdurrahman is the Kurdistan Regional Government's representative to the United States of America. Key to her role are strengthening ties between Kurdistan and the United States, advocating her government's position on wide array of political, security, humanitarian, economic, and cultural matters, and promoting coordination and partnership. Prior to her appointment in 2015, Ms. Abdurrahman was the high representative to the United Kingdom before her career in public service. Ms. Abdurrahman worked as a journalist for 17 years. Ms. Abdurrahman, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, very kind introduction. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the Kurdish National Congress of North America for hosting this panel and for inviting me to be part of it. Also to commend you uh, for the great work that you do. Um, I, I grew up in the UK as uh, a member of the Kurdish diaspora. So I appreciate the role of the Kurdish diaspora. We do have a role. We have influenced things back home and we have a role in advocacy abroad. So. Uh, kudos to KNC for the great work that you've done over three decades, or maybe longer now. Um, so the title of, of the discussion really uh, uh, makes Kurdistan look under very severe threat. 
And in many ways it is. Um, the Middle East is very turbulent, very fragile. Um, relationships are ebbing and flowing, as we can see in, in developments in Syria. Um, but I think Kurdistan region in Iraq also has strengths. And uh, I will come back to that point. So I would like to begin by actually looking at what's happening around the world. Uh, what happens in Kurdistan region or in Iraq or Syria, Turkey, Iran, doesn't happen in isolation. You need to have a, a good understanding of what's happening globally. There are many people who argue that today we are in a G0 world, not G7, G20, etc. We are in a G0 world, meaning that there isn't a real clear world leadership. Of course, the United States has the biggest economy, the biggest army. Uh, it is the superpower. But uh, clearly, the United States doesn't want to play the role that it played in the past. Uh, that's clear with President Trump. But also, it was clear under President Obama. Uh, President Obama was uh, elected on the platform that uh, the U.S. would not engage in wars and that the U.S. should not intervene. Um, so we are in this situation now where you could argue that there isn't a very clear world leadership, not just by one power, but even collectively. Even collectively, if you were to look at, uh, let's say, Europe, Canada, uh, US, Australia, the, the Western powers, collectively, they quite often seem to panic and shrug their shoulders. And one very good example of that is the refugee crisis. After ISIS uh, took over parts of Iraq and Syria, there was a flood of refugees. The result of the Arab Spring, there were flood of refugees. Uh, right now, I believe there are about uh, 70 million refugees and displaced people around the world. How did Europe react? Europe, which was the champion of human rights and asylum and refugees, suddenly they... <laughs> let people drown in the Mediterranean. When Europeans were tested, when European democracy and human rights was tested, I'm sorry to say, I think Europe failed. So this is what I mean by a, a lack of global leadership. Uh, I'm not pinpointing the blame on any one country. I'm uh, saying this is the state that we're in. So that lack of global leadership has an impact all over the world, including the Middle East, including Iraq, Syria, Turkey, Iran, and of course, Kurdistan, whether it's Kurdistan region in Iraq or in Turkey, Syria, or Iran. Then we also have the great power competition that's going on around the world, whether it's in the uh, in economy uh, between the United States and China primarily, there is that great power competition, or whether it's more on the national security and uh, military aspect. And you can see that being played out, frankly, in Syria. And of course, that impacts our brethren in Syria, our brothers and sisters there, but also the rest of us, whether we're Kurds in Turkey, Iran, or Iraq. What happens in Syria impacts us, both at a personal level, um, at a community level. We are all Kurds, we are all brothers and sisters, but also at a political level and how the world perceives us. So the great power competition, I think, is also something else that is impacting what happens to us. Then let's look at the Middle East. Well, the Middle East uh, has really been the hotbed of tin pot dictators uh, fighting over their own supremacy, nobody accepting the other. If you're an Arab, you don't accept the Fars. If you're the Fars, you don't accept the Kurd, and so on and so on. So the Middle East hasn't really been the, the place of peaceful coexistence and respect for the other. How many genocides have we Kurds suffered and endured? At least in Iraqi Kurdistan, those genocides have been documented. There have been trials and so on. And yet the world turns a blind eye. It's the Middle East. It's where these things happen. So unfortunately, geography has not been kind to the Kurds. We are in the Middle East. We can't pack up and, and go and be neighbors to Switzerland. So I think what happens in the Middle East and the culture of the Middle East 
the culture of violence, the culture of cruelty, the culture of silence, the culture of not accepting the other, the lack of respect for the other, the lack of understanding that, um, that you can have a win-win situation. Conceding something to your opponent doesn't mean you have lost everything. It means that you've given them something and maybe they give you something and you could have a win-win situation. We don't really see that, generally speaking, as a culture of politics in the Middle East. So now, now let's look at Kurdistan region in Iraq. This is the world that we live in. This is the global picture that little Kurdistan region with a population of five, six million, six million if you include all of the displaced and the refugees, and we should include them. They are part of our, uh, our community. Six million people in a region, not even in a sovereign state. Geography has not been kind to us. Here we are surrounded, frankly, by hostile countries. Um, we know that despite our best efforts to have good relations with Turkey, and we do have good relations with Turkey, and we should have good relations with Turkey, we need both of us, Turkey and Kurdistan and Iraq, need to do trade together. We are very significant trading partners for each other. Trade is what creates livelihoods. Trade is what creates jobs. Trade is what allows people in Kurdistan region to be able to feed their families. It's not something dirty. Sometimes I think in our culture, we see money and economics as something dirty. Money is what makes the world go round. Money is what creates political partnerships. Trade is what creates uh, friendships, alliances. We need to do trade with Turkey. We need to have a good relationship with Turkey. But does that mean that we agree with everything that Turkey does? Does that mean that Turkey agrees with everything that we do? No, of course not. Even the best of friends can disagree. And I'm not necessarily describing this that way. I'm just giving an example. Do we need to have a good relationship with Iran? Absolutely, 100%. Iran, Turkey are huge superpowers in the region. Turkey has the largest, second largest military after the United States in NATO. So just think about that. The second largest military in NATO after the United States, that is Turkey. Iran has some kind of nuclear capability. Uh, of course, it says that it's not for military purposes, but that gives you an indication of the kind of power and authority that Iran has. This is where we are. Of course, Syria and Iraq are, are a different game. But I think our, our, our people sometimes think that Kurdistan region is a superpower, it's a sovereign state. We are not a sovereign state. We do not have the tools of a sovereign state. For example, we cannot buy weapons because we don't have the authority to issue end user certificates. The sovereign state, Baghdad, has the authority to issue an end user certificate to buy a weapon. Does Baghdad do that? Please think about that. Does Baghdad do that for the Kurdistan region? Why is it that when ISIS attacked, the Peshmerga were not able at the beginning to fight back? Because they didn't have the weapons. Baghdad had the weapons. So let's really be realistic about Kurdistan region's powers authority, soft power, and limitations. So what do we have in the Kurdistan region? As I said earlier, yes, we are under threat. Absolutely we are, but we are not completely powerless. Number one, we have the Kurdish diaspora. We cannot be silenced when we're abroad. You know, in the 80s, when I was protesting outside the Iraqi embassy, um, people were being killed. Uh, Saddam was sending his assassins abroad to poison them and kill them, but the diaspora would not be silenced. So the diaspora has a role to play. Then, of course, the Kurdistan regional government, our leadership, our representatives in Baghdad, our role in Baghdad as well. All of these things give us tools where we can highlight what's going on, the threats that we face, and we can try to challenge those adversaries adversaries in a different platform. 
yes, of course, the Kurdistan region as a region doesn't have a role to play um, in, in the UN. We are not a member of the United States. We don't even have uh, an observer status. But we can talk to the ambassadors. We can talk to the different organizations and agencies within the UN. We can talk to the different member states. Here in Washington, we talk to everybody. Of course, our primary focus is the White House, the State Department, the DOD, the Treasury, US Congress. We, we talk to members of Congress all the time. All the time we're talking to them. We explain what's happening in our region, in the Kurdistan region, in Iraq, but also in the wider neighborhood. And many of them rely on us as a reliable source of information, not just about what's happening in Erbil, Soleimani, Duhok, and Halabja, but what's happening in Baghdad, what's happening in our neighborhood. We have those tools that maybe we didn't have 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. We also have a role to play in terms of the economy. Oil prices right now are, of course, at a low and Kurdistan region, Iraq, both of us are struggling very, very severely. And people in Kurdistan are going through a very, very tough time. But the fact that we have oil, the fact that we have gas, means that we do have a role to play. For example, we are part of the international solution for energy needs. And that is something that we can use and we have been using and will continue to do so. In terms of security, the Peshmerga forces have proven themselves to be reliable partners to the global coalition. And this is a coalition of 80 or so countries now. Of course, we're reliable partners to the United States. That role is being strengthened, not weakened. So we need to also remember that. But also, I would argue, the international community needs us in Iraq for Iraq to succeed. Nobody in the international community wants to see Iraq to fail. Nobody wants Iraq to be a failed state. The Kurds, politically, economically, and militarily, are part of Iraq's success and making Iraq a success. So the world needs us for that as well. So we have all of these tools and we use them. Sometimes the KRG, including myself, but of course uh, leaders back home, are criticized. Why aren't we condemning this? Why aren't we condemning that? Not all of, demo not all of diplomacy is done in public. Not all of diplomacy is done on Twitter. We have meetings these days. We have virtual meetings. We have phone calls, we have socially distant face-to-face -face meetings, uh, but not everything is done in public. And sometimes you need that quiet diplomacy to continue so that you can be heard and action can be taken. But those of you who are not necessarily restrained or constricted by that, you can speak out and I encourage you to do this, to do so. I encourage you to use social media, in the days where protests could have been held, I encourage you to do that. That is your right, and you should speak out. And I used to speak out when I was just a, an ordinary member of, of the Kurdish community. Now I, have, I wear a different hat, and I need to be very mindful of what I say, but not everybody does. Please speak out and speak your mind, and lobby in every way that you can. Lobbying shouldn't be left just to an embassy or a representation or a political uh, representation or party. Lobbying should be done by everybody, as we can see from the many lobby groups that we see here in the United States. So I will stop there. I think I have spoken uh, for far longer than my allotted time, but thank you very much once again. Uh, yes, there are many threats flying around in, in, in uh, the Middle East, but we also have tools and we are using them. And don't forget that we are operating in a global situation where Kurdistan doesn't really control that. We are just part of what's happening. So over to you and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bayan Khan, uh, for your great highlight on the entire region. Uh, I will go for uh, my next uh, guest, uh, Mr. Uh, Gran Ozjan. Buran Ojan 
in the People's Democratic Party, HDP, representative to the United States of America. After graduating from the University of Warwick with a sociology degree, he worked at the Center for Turkey Studies in London between 2011 and 2016. He was founding editor at The Region, an online news outlet covering the Middle East. He has been working with HDP in its overseas representative offices since 2016 and was appointed to be uh, their U.S. representative in 2017. Uh, the floor is uh, yours, Mr. Uh, Grand. You are welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Isam. Um, and thank you very much uh, to the KNC for organizing such a timely event in such a risky time. Um, and I want to thank Bayan Khan as well for drawing a great picture of, of the current state of affairs, both globally and regionally, um, because I think it, 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 gave, it gives me now a perfect opportunity because I want to go into history a little bit and I don't want to bore anyone, but um, I do think that in order to understand both the opportunities and the risks and the dangers that we as the Kurdish people face today, we do have to go back in uh, and look at how history has not been uh, very kind to us either, as much as geography, I'm afraid. Um, and so uh, I do want to start off by, you know, I, I know these kind of panels always start off with the crumbling of the Ottoman Empire and how, how the Kurds were left with nothing after after the First World War, uh, especially with the Sykes-Picot Agreement in 1916, with, with the you know, historical lands that the Kurds have lived on for thousands of years were shared between uh, the Turkish nation state, a Persian nation, the Iranian nation state, and Syria and Iraq, which gave the Arabs of the region their own nation states as well. Um, but the Kurds were, as I said, left with nothing. Uh, and in lands that they had, had lived for for thousands of years, suddenly they were not just second-class citizens, but their very existence in a lot of places, especially in Turkey, which I'm going to talk about more, um, was completely rejected. I mean, it wasn't just about whether the Kurds were second or third-class citizens. They were not seen as Kurds, and their very existence was brushed aside. And throughout this time, um, the Kurds, the Kurdish people, just like any other people would, uh, stood up and wanted to say, both politically and culturally, that, that they were Kurds. And, uh, you know, in the last hundred years, there's a, there's a well-known saying amongst us Kurds that, you know, there have been tens of, I think the figure was at 1.28 or 29 Kurdish rebellions against this very uh, oppression that, that we as the Kurdish people were faced from all sorts of, uh, all, from all sides, actually. And uh, all of these, whether violent or non-violent, because there are examples of both, were brutally suppressed and actually crushed. Um, and Bayan Khan mentioned the genocides. Uh, some are internationally recognized, some or most aren't yet. Uh, but this is what the Kurds were faced with at, at any moment when the Kurdish people wanted to express themselves, actually scream at the top of their lungs and say that we exist as a people we exist and this existence based on this existence we have rights we want to be able to speak our language we want to be able to name our children Kurdish names we want to be able to organize as a people um, and this proved very difficult um, and, and millions of thousands hundreds of thousands of Kurds paid the ultimate price throughout the last 100 years. Now, when we speak about the Kurdistan region being in the crosshairs today, we see that there are especially two nation states that are very active uh, in any anti-Kurdish sentiment or policy in the region. And uh, Turkey and Iran are the lead actors. Um, but I'm going to separate Turkey from this because I believe that Turkey is the lead actor and always takes the lead when uh, there is some sort of Kurdish dynamism uh, or a Kurdish uh, expression of some sort of status or uh, the establishment of anything Kurdish in the region. And the first and toughest war it comes up against is the Turkish nation state. And again, this is grounded on history because we see 
in Syria, Iraq, and Iran, the Kurds have gone through incredibly uh, inhumane atrocities. Um, but when it comes to Turkey, there's always an added uh, an added flavour to the to the way that they've uh, dealt with things. Um, but right now, for example, we've shared this land for thousands of years. Um, both the Arabs and the Persians can say that they are indigenous to the land. Um, historically speaking, the Turkish people can be traced back to about a thousand years ago who have come into Anatolia uh, and especially in the last 100 years have founded a nation state, a Turkish nation state based on that ethnicity. And so the Turkish nation state's legitimacy has always been up for, you know, it can be questioned a bit more directly. And this is why uh, the, self the, the Turkish insecurity is deeper than both the Persian and the Arab insecurity uh, in, in the way that they occupy Kurdish lands. Um, and so this is what, what I think animates the Turkish hostility towards any kind of Kurdish expression of uh, any kind of political demand, um, let alone demanding or expressing its own existence. And this is why we see Turkey taking the lead in both uh, Rojava in, in Syria, in Bashur, in, in the Kurdistan region. We see Turkey on the front foot and leading the anti-Kurdish policies, bombing Kurds um, all over the place. And I know, in, especially in Bashur, in, in the Kurdistan region, the premise is that we are bombing the PKK. But, uh, you know, even with the independence referendum of 2017, we saw Erdogan, who, by, you know, until recently, by many Kurds, was seen as maybe friendlier to the Kurdish people than, than previous Turkish leaders. But even he threatened uh, the Kurds in Bashur with starvation when 90, more than, close to 100%, 97% of the Kurds in Bashur voted for independence. This is the will of 97% of the people, of the Kurds in the Kurdistan region. They declared their will and their, their desire to, to be independent, which is the right of any people on the face of this earth. Uh, and we saw Erdogan uh, respond to this with a threat to starve 6 million people there. Um, and, you know, and this is the friendliest Turkish leader that we can come up with. And so um, this is not just about uh, violence. This is not just about a question of the PKK. This is a, a question of the Kurdish people wanting to exist in their own homeland of, a thousands, of thousands of years that, and wanted to scream at the top of their voice and say that we do exist. And because of this existence, as a distinct people of the region, we want to be able to speak our language. You know, some Kurds want to uh, establish an independent nation state. Some other Kurds may not. But all Kurds want to live with dignity. All Kurds want to be acknowledged as a distinct people with a distinct culture, with a distinct history, and want to express themselves po politically, culturally in that region. Now, um, today, you know, we see Turkey, as I said, leading this anti-Kurdish effort. Uh, because it believes that if the Kurdish people, which they are doing right now in Bashur, uh, we've had a regional government there that has uh, been autonomous and has run its affairs for almost two decades now. Um, in Rojava now, we're seeing uh, the Kurds who were very effective against you know, one of the most inhumane organizations we've seen, uh, especially in, in my lifetime at least, uh, who were very successful in fighting uh, off ISIS and actually fighting them off on behalf of the whole world uh, because they had the whole world in their crosshairs. Their target was not just that region, but the whole world, as we saw in France, as we saw in Manchester, in the UK. But we saw Kurds also establishing themselves, uh, establishing, uh, you know, by many accounts, a very, uh, you know, comparatively speaking, a very democratic, egalitarian system, unlike many other in the region. And, uh, and now, you know, we see a second part of Kurdistan liberating itself, putting itself on the map and actually gaining a lot of acceptance and acknowledgement from a lot of international powers. And even, you know, the US is now on the ground engaging with these Kurds uh, militarily and tactically until now. Uh, but we're seeing certain steps where this can uh, or may become a more political relationship and maybe even a strategic one going forward. 
Uh, and I believe that this has really angered the Turkish state. And, uh, you know, the Turkish state now feels very insecure because half of the Kurds, half of the Kurdish population in the region actually live in Turkey. And what the Turkish state has opted to do throughout history, um, as I mentioned, with massacres in my hometown of Dersim, uh, a crosscut in Zilan, in, in the Arbakan, we've had massacres throughout history. But right now as well, under, under the Erdogan government, members of my party, uh, we are the third largest political party in Turkey. Uh, we get around 6 million, which is about 12 to 13 percent of the vote in Turkey. Um, and yet we have members of parliament in prison right now. So, you know, these are people that have never, ever uh, hurt a fly in their life in their lives and uh, they find themselves in Turkish prison for voicing Kurdish demands. Um, we have now a Turkey that is conducting operate cross-border operations in both the Kurdistan region and into Syria because there is a Kurdish demand, there is um, you know, an establishment of Kurdish status in these regions um, and uh, the Turkish state rather than engaging with the Kurdish people, rather than engaging with its own Kurdish population, it, especially in the last four or five years, has turned to uh, policies that are so outdated that have been tried and tested throughout the last century, but ha that has only led to a tougher Kurdish reaction um, across the whole of Kurdistan. In my lifetime, and I, I mean, I'm only 34, but in my lifetime, I've never seen the Kurdish community or the Kurdish people from all four parts of Kurdistan this united. Um, and so, you know, I, the whole question comes down to this. This is a historical question. This is, as Bayan Khan said, a geographic question. But this, and this is also a global question that has implications. You know, the, the global picture that Bayan Khan drew definitely has implications for us as, as the West and as, as the US is isolating itself from these regions. Other powers are hoping to fill that vacuum. And, and we're seeing a more activist Turkey right now, especially trying to see what it can grab uh, during this vacuum. Um, and I think for us Kurds, the question comes down to this. We are only a threat to these uh, oppressive states as long as we demand or we, we claim to exist. As long as we, as, Kurd as the Kurdish people say that we exist and we want our rights that derive from this very existence, then we are going to be in the crosshairs. Now, um, we can easily say, look, we're, you know, some say 40, some even say 50 million Kurds right now, but we don't necessarily have the desire to, to be ourselves. We don't have the desire to, to be free as Kurds, then fine. You know, we can go ahead and continue living in Turkey as Turks. We can continue living in Syria as Arabs or as non-citizens, if we still want to be Kurds there. We can continue living in Iran uh, um, and just, you know, not say anything Kurdish, because as soon as we do, we get executed there. Um, and right now in, you know, in Iraq and in the Kurdistan region, we can continue to just bow to every demand Baghdad has and not have any issues. But uh, I'm happy to see that, that right now the Kurds have rejected the status quo in all of these four countries and are demanding that at the very least, that we as a Kurdish people, people live with our dignity, live with our culture, and are able to express our political demands in whatever setting that may be. In Turkey, we're doing that through the HDP, we're doing that through a lot of civil society organizations, and we're standing up against Erdogan's authoritarianism. In Rojava, the Kurds are doing that. Uh, you know, whether it's societal transformation, whether it's a very badass fight against ISIS, um, and uh, I think this is going to continue. And as this continues, we're going to be in the crosshairs. But uh, there is, you know, we do have options. Uh, and in Turkey, we as the HDP want to sit down and get the Turkish state to, to face its own history, that it can live with the Kurds if it chooses to, that if it does sit down with the Kurds and if it does accept that the Kurdish people exist, that the Kurdish people have dignity, they have their own language, they have their own political rights and demands, then uh, there can be a path forward in which we, we don't have to be in anyone's crosshairs and no one will then be in ours. Um, I, think, I think I want to finish with that sentence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Grant. So thank you for your 
a great highlight on especially on Turkey and that's uh, our subject today. Thank you. Uh, we are going uh, to go for our next uh, uh, guest, uh, a great friend of Kurtz in North America. Yeah, uh, Dr. David. His Excellency Dr. David Pollock is uh, so the brainstem fellow at the Washington Institute. Focuses focuses on the political dynamics of Middle East countries. He is the director of Project Fikra, a program of research publication and network building uh, and network building designed to generate policy ideas of uh, for promoting positive change and countering the spread of extremism in the Middle East. At the forefront of this effort is Fikra Forum, a unique Arab English bilingual uh, online platform that promotes exchanges between mainstream Muslims and Arab Democrats and US decision makers and opinion leaders. Dr. Pollock, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, my appreciation to you and to the organization that you lead and to our other panelists and of course to all of our audience participants and i'm delighted to see that the number is actually growing even as this um, seminar goes on so we have well over 50 participants that's terrific uh, i would like to respond directly to the particular narrow focus that i was asked to talk about which is US policy on all of these issues. And so I'm going to try and be very brief and not uh, go back into history very much at all. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna try and look to the future rather than to the past in my comments. And I look forward to your questions and to the discussion that will soon follow. So, the topic that I was given is uh, US policy toward Turkey and the Kurds as the Kurdistan region in its different parts is now, as the, our title suggests, in the crosshairs of outside powers. Um, and the first part of the answer to that question, what is US policy toward the Kurds, is which Kurds? Uh, because the US government, and I am going to try very hard to analyze the realities of this situation as I see them, rather than to indulge in prescription or advocacy for the moment. The US government sees the region primarily through the lens of countries, not peoples, and governments, not communities. And so the US government actually has quite different policies toward the Kurds in the different countries that constitute the major geographic center of Kurdish life, whether it's Iran, Iraq, Syria, or Turkey. And I want to just say a few words about each one of those separately. The largest one is Turkey in terms of the sheer number of Kurds living within its borders. And U.S. policy toward what has sometimes been called the Kurdish question in Turkey, inside Turkey, consists, first of all, of an agreement with the Turkish government. And it's very important to just state this as a fact, that the PKK is a terrorist organization. That is official U.S. policy on that question. And for that reason, the U.S. government actually accepts Turkish military incursions into neighboring countries uh, in order to, as Turkey claims, to fight against the PKK. And um, the U.S. has stated, for example, recently in response to Turkish incursions inside Iraq that uh, we would like Iraq and Turkey to work together to fight against the PKK rather than see Turkey do this unilaterally. But the principle is that Turkey, in cooperation with neighboring governments, has the right to fight, literally fight against the PKK beyond its borders. And 
that I'm not saying that I agree with that policy. I'm just stating it as a fact of life that we need to be very cognizant of. So that's the first element of US policy toward the so-called Kurdish question inside Turkey or the Turkish government's relationship with the Kurds. The second key element of it is not a formal policy, but I think this is the reality, which is that the US is not going to intervene in terms of Turkey's relations with its Kurdish population. Uh, and that means that unfortunately, in my view, um, that the United States government is not going to raise in any serious way questions with the Turkish government about its treatment of Kurdish or pro-Kurdish political parties or uh, the scorched earth campaign that Turkey has waged in some of its eastern provinces in Jizre and other parts, uh, in Diyarbakir uh, to some extent and in other parts of the country against what it claims are Turkish are Kurdish, I'm sorry, uh, terrorists or insurgents. Uh, the US government basically keeps silent about all of that. And I think that that's wrong, uh, but I think that we need to understand that this too is a fact of life because for the US government, the priority is on Turkey's cooperation on other fronts such as it is in NATO and in the Middle East as a whole, and in trying to make sure that Turkish policy does not stray even further from the Western alliance, from American interests, and even more toward some form of cooperation with Russia and or with Iran or with other powers in the region that might sacrifice larger, as the US government sees it, American interests and other allies that we have in the region. And the Kurdish question is simply for the US government, a lower priority than any of those uh, other uh, regional or global issues regarding Turkey. Now we come to uh, some of the details and uh, Vladimir, I think is going to talk more about um, Syria and Iraq. And I'm not going to get into those details myself, uh, how the US relates to Turkish activities, particularly in Syria, regarding the Kurdish uh, population of the country and the autonomous administration that the Kurds and their local allies have set up there. I'm not going to go into any detail except to say this, that uh, having had an opportunity very, very recently to speak to the very most senior US government officials who deal with these issues um, from uh, 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 privately, and so I can't mention their names, but I will say that they see the situation in Rojava or Syria as far as Turkey and the Kurds is very complicated and delicate and dangerous and fragile, but one in which the United States, they believe, it, despite President Trump's occasional changes of heart on these issues, they believe this is one situation in which the United States is committed to remain in the game in a way that they hope will be able to balance Turkish and Kurdish and other players on Syrian territory. Um, and to do this in a way that it is true, has sacrificed the Kurds in Afrin, where the United States said right from the start, we have nothing to do with that. They haven't been our partners, so the US government declared in the campaign against ISIS, and Afrin is outside the scope of our concerns. Uh, we were focused only on east of the Euphrates. Uh, that was the American policy in 2014 and 15 and 16, and I think that is still the case uh, today. But east of the Euphrates, although the United States has allowed the Turks, in effect, to establish a uh, uh, secure zone, as they call it, uh, an occupied zone, as I call it, uh, across the border in northern Syria, basically all the way, uh, or almost all the way from the Mediterranean, all the way to the Iraqi border, the United States has basically allowed Turkey to do that. And yet the United States continues to maintain at least a small 
presence, military and other, on the ground inside Syria, working with the SDF, with General Maslum, with the autonomous administration uh, led by the Kurds and including their local Arab and other allies in Syria, and I think is committed to remain in that role indefinitely. And in fact, the US government uh, believes that Turkey, strangely enough, and this may sound very perverse or counterintuitive, at least to many of us, the US government believes that Turkey actually prefers the, the United States remain in that role uh, as a kind of buffer between Turkey and the SDF or the uh, YPG, PYD. Uh, forces in Syria, because otherwise uh, those forces would almost certainly move toward greater reliance, even greater reliance on uh, the Assad regime and maybe some of its allies, including Russia or possibly even others, um, and pose a larger threat actually to Turkish forces and to Turkish security, even as the government in Ankara sees it without an American uh, mediating and buffer role in that territory. So I think the U.S. actually sees an autonomous Kurdish-led region in Syria in roughly, very roughly, a similar fashion to the way the U.S. government sees the Kurds in Iraq and the Kurdistan region in Iraq. It is a, a region, not an independent country. It is one that enjoys and the US government believes should continue to enjoy a certain measure of autonomy or at least local self-government with US protection, active US protection. Uh, and I think that in the long run, the US probably still entertains some hope that Turkey may someday, once again, because even Erdogan actually did see it this way for a few years in 2013, 14, and 15, uh, that Turkey may once again come to see Kurdish autonomy across the border in Syria in roughly the same way that it sees it in Iraq as a friendly um, neighbor and a neighbor that will cooperate or at least tolerate Turkish anti-PKK activity um, and um, have common interests with Turkey in the economic and diplomatic and political and even personal realms. Someday, perhaps, that may happen. I think uh, I personally don't see Erdogan changing his mind about this anytime in the foreseeable future. Um, now, let me turn to uh, the last uh, piece of the puzzle, which is less often discussed, but needs to be mentioned. And I'll conclude with this. And that, those are the Kurds in Iran. They are the second largest Kurdish community in the region, uh, numbering at least, by most estimates, 7 million, maybe more than that, uh, maybe up to 10 million. Um, so a significant proportion of the total population of the country, and they are oppressed like most people in Iran, but even more so. They are denied their basic rights, not only because the Islamic Republic of Iran is a dictatorship, but in all but name, but also because as Kurds, they have no recourse to even normal judicial proceedings or political representation. There is not a single Kurdish governor in any Kurdish province of Iran. There is not a single Kurdish policymaker at the highest levels of the Iranian government. And this is uh, many of the political prisoners um, in Iran, including many of those who are executed by Iran every year, are Kurds. Um, very disproportionately so. And we look at all of this, and I'm sorry to say we shake our heads and shrug our shoulders and move on. The United States, although it is committed to a policy of maximum pressure against the regime in Tehran, has, to my knowledge, not raised the Kurdish issue, not engaged actually at all with the Kurdish issue in Iran in any serious way. And while we do honestly strive 
to contain and roll back Iranian influence in Syria uh, and in Iraq in a way that I believe would benefit the Kurds in those countries very substantially in the long run. Uh, I don't see any realistic or even unrealistic US policy of uh, regime change in Iran or any other kind of transformation in Iran that would uh, liberate or even improve the political, cultural, economic, civil, and personal rights of the very large Kurdish population of that country. So in that sense, the Kurds in Iran are as much in the crosshairs of hegemonic powers inside their own country as any Kurds anywhere else in the region or anywhere else in the world. And this is an issue that, although perhaps not the focus of today's seminar, is one that I think deserves more attention in the future. And I will end my remarks with that and very much welcome your questions and comments. And thank you again for the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you very much, Dr. David, thank you. Uh, we really appreciate your presence. Uh, we are going to go for our next uh, guest, uh, also a great friend of the Kurds, uh, Mr. Vladimir Van Wilgenburg. Vladimir Van Wilgenburg is a journalist and political analyst specializing in issues concerning Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Turkey, with a particular focus on Kurdish politics. In 2011, Van Wilgenburg received an MA from the University of Utrecht Conflict Studies and Human Rights Program. There, he completed his MA dissertation on the Iraqi city of Kirkuk, Arab political spectrum. Much of his work was based on first land research and interviews conducted by Mr. Van Wilgenburg on the ground in Iraq. Mr. Uh, Brigenburg, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, yes. Well, welcome everyone to my, uh, my presentation. So I'm going to talk mostly about the Turkish policy towards the Iraqi Kurds. I'll be less diplomatic because I'm not a diplomat, thank God. And um, so, um, first of all, um, both Iran and Turkey, um, in history, they had uh, alliances with the KDP and also with the PUK, uh, mostly often against the PKK, but still these countries, they opposed an official status for the Kurds. So when the U.S. liberated Iraq from Saddam Hussein, Turkey was very much opposed to the U.S. Uh, liberation or invasion. And actually, Turkey tried to assassinate a Kirkuk governor, but the U.S. actually prevented that and arrested uh, Turkish soldiers, which is like a huge shame in the Turkish history. And there's even a, a sort of Turkish Hollywood movie about this, Kurtlar Fadisi. Um, so, for instance, this Turkish policy in the beginning was very much focused on Kirkuk because Turkey really opposed Kurds controlling Kirkuk. So. Uh, in 2017, for instance, Barzani said, if Turkey is going to intervene in Kirkuk, then we also have the right to intervene in Diyarbakir, like the sort of uh, traditional Kurdish capital of, uh, of Kurdistan. So the relations in the beginning uh, were not so good between uh, the Kurdistan regional government and, uh, and Turkey. But this changed uh, after 2009, when uh, the AK party said, we're going to do a more uh, democratic opening. And also there was a Turkish intelligence chief at that time, that was more open to better relations with at least the Iraqi Kurds. So in 2010, uh, Turkey opened the consulate in Erbil. Uh, also, they started directly importing Kurdish oil independently from Baghdad, uh, which also became a huge problem in the, in the few, in later stage uh, between Erbil and Baghdad. And also, furthermore, there was a peace process uh, between uh, Turkey and the PKK. Erdogan sometimes says, we never talk to terrorists, uh, blah, blah, blah. But in the end, I mean, according to Turkey, PKK is terrorist, but several times they had talks with, with the PKK in Europe and also with Ocalan. And also there were actually several talks with the PYD. Saleh Muslim went to Turkey several times. Um, also there was actually coordination between the YPG and Turkey to evacuate the Suleiman Shah shrine. Uh, also during the Kobani battle, Turkey allowed Peshmerga to go to, uh, to Kobani. 
And even after the breakdown of the peace process, uh, SDF leaders from Mumbich Military Council visited the Incherdik base. Uh, but in July 2015, this peace process ended. And some people say is because Turkey was very fed up also with uh, what was happening in Kobani. Uh, because um, before 2014, the PYD never had any support from the US. But after 2014, during the battle from Kobani, for the first time, the US started supporting uh, the YPG. So Turkey was very afraid of that. And that's why you see the arguments of, of Turkey changing. So if you look to Erdogan's speech in 2015, he basically said, we do not want to see what's happening in Northern Iraq and Northern Syria. So basically this is going back to the old Turkish policy saying that we should not have the same thing, a recognized Kurdish autonomous area in Syria, like what we have before in Iraq. And when there was the independence referendum, there was a sort of alliance between Iraq, Iran, and Turkey. And um, Turkey at that time actually wanted to bypass the KRG by opening uh, a sec, like a, another border crossing, the Ovajik uh, border crossing. And for the goal for that was to basically bypass uh, the oil issue because they wanted all the oil that goes to Turkey, it has to somehow go through KRG or Kurdistan region territory. So at that time during the referendum, there was a sort of de facto deal between Abadi and Erdogan to make a bypass and to basically curtail uh, Kurdish autonomy there. And also after the referendum, also in October 2017, Erdogan also saying we have to dis disrupt this terror corridor what they, what they want to create from the east to the Mediterranean. So there were first in Turkey that through the um, YPG, the SDF, there could be sort of a link up from the Kurdistan region to the Mediterranean Sea. And there was one Kurdish official who made some comments about that on Twitter. Uh, but I mean, Turkey was using this as a justification basically for Turkish military operations. Although I personally never thought that it was very feasible that the Kurds in Syria would be able even with US support to go all the way to the Mediterranean Sea because there are some Kurds around the sea there in uh, Jabal, uh, I think it's called Jabal al-Turkman and Kurd, like close to Idlib, but it's like a very like rebel held, regime held zone. So it's very difficult to do that. And also Erdogan also in 2017 said, we don't want to have another Kobani. So like Erdogan really saw the victory of the Kurds in Kobani against ISIS as a huge defeat for Erdogan himself. And also, I think Giron can maybe talk also more about that. It's also about that um, AK Party was not very successful and losing votes to the HDP. And that's also, I think, uh, was a bit, uh, Erdogan was a little bit dissatisfied with that, that the HDP didn't say, for instance, we're going to vote all for the AK Party. Um, so Turkey launched like three military operations in northern Syria. Uh, the first one was after the SDF took control of Mambic. Um, Turkey for the first time started to military intervene and they controlled a large area in northern Aleppo from Azaz all the way to Jarabulus and al -Bab. And then also Turkey bombed the Karachok base in April 2017 and several people from the Yepege got killed in that. And that was also the first time that Maslum got into the picture. General Maslum at that time visited uh, this uh, base after the Turkish bombing with a US general. And Turkey continued doing operations. So, uh, in January 2018, it did an operation in Afrin. And then quite recently in October, they did an operation in, uh, in Tel Abiyat and Serekania. But this operation was, uh, was limited to that. Uh, but actually the Turkish plan was to control the whole border area where all the Kurds live. And also Turkey has been carrying out uh, military operations in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan on the border last year in 2019, but also recently in June. Uh, Turkey has been carrying out a lot of border operations and it's getting more heavy and heavy. And I think the difference is uh, comparing to the past that Turkey did ground operations that Turkey is now effectively using drones against the PKK. Also, they were using drones in Rojava against the YPG. And this makes it very difficult for the Kurds as an insurgent group to fight back against Turkey because it's very difficult to fight those drones. And in the past, uh, there was not this ability, Turkey didn't have this ability to use these drones. So even like there were some PKK uh, officials were killed close to Slemani uh, because the drones are so uh, targeting uh, specifically certain people. So this was uh, the Turkish plan uh, during, um, in 2019. They actually wanted to control this whole border area from Jarablus all the way to Derik. And in this 30 kilometer safe zone, they actually wanted to basically uh, place uh, millions of Syrians that are based in Turkey. 
So there were like thousands and thousands of Syrians that fled to Turkey during the Syrian uh, civil war. And Turkey basically wanted to put all those people on these border areas. So the effect of such a Turkish invasion would be is that there would be no more Kurds living in that area because the Kurds at that time that were living on the border, around one to two million Kurds or more, they will then be forced to either flee to the Kurdistan region or they will be forced to flee to the areas more lower in the Arab areas. And we also saw in Afrin that the demography got changed because Turkey brought um, Syrians from Damascus, from Idlib, from Homs, from other areas to Afrin. And if you look to now, like Afrin in 2018, like before the Turkish invasion, it was a majority Kurdish region, but now it's like a Kurdish minority region. And basically Turkey wanted to do the same in the rest of Northeastern Syria, but because of a Russian and a Turkish and a US and a Turkish ceasefire agreement, basically the Turkish occupation was limited to Tel Abyad uh, and to Serakania. And here you see like the current situation. Uh, I mean, the Kurds also to stop a Turkish invasion uh, also invited the Syrian government and Russian forces. And the US, they withdrew their, from their bases around Mumbij and Kobani and Aina Issa and other areas to, um, to the Hasaka and the Derezor province. And although Trump wanted to actually pull out completely, in the end, he was convinced to just stay in the oil areas. But it's not that like US is stealing the, the oil of Syria. I mean, this all the oil is managed by the local self-administration in northeastern Syria. So it's not related to that they're stealing the oil as what sometimes is suggested in the media, especially by pro-Syrian pro regime uh, sources. For instance, recently they published a story saying that oil was stolen and sent by the US to the Iraq, but it was actually all being sold to the Iraqi Kurds. So the situation like until now, it's still like this. But there are still like a lot of fears, uh, especially in Kobani and Aini Issa, but also in Tirbispi, that there could be another Turkish invasion because Turkey is still not happy because they, they want to destroy this autonomous project. And until now, they're still an autonomous administration in northeastern Syria. They're paying higher salaries than the Syrian regime. For instance, recently there was a decision that they're not going to allow the Syrian regime to do elections in the areas controlled by the SDF. So Turkey is very unhappy with this, and that's why they're cutting the water. Um, they're also preventing the self-administration the SDF to be part of uh, peace talks in Geneva. And um, that's why there's still fears, like there were rumors that Turkey recently uh, was trying to convince uh, the US and NATO from doing another ground operation, but they didn't get the permission. And that afterwards they were trying with Iran and Russia to uh, get permission to do another operation because Actually, all the time that Turkey did this ground operations, they sort of got permission from Russia and from Iran uh, because Turkey is legally, uh, has no legal status in Syria. I mean, there used to be an Adana agreement uh, in the past that gave Turkey some form of permission to go in the border areas. But this, this I mean, it's not allowed according to this agreement to occupy such uh, large areas. And that's because Turkey has also territorial ambitions, like they have a new Ottoman territorial ambition. And you also see that in Libya. I mean, there's no PKK in Libya, but Turkey is very actively involved in Libya. Now they also want to get involved in uh, the Armenian-Azerbaijan conflict. And also they're quite heavily involved, for instance, in Somalia. So Turkey has ambitions and that's the goal is to basically contain Kurdish autonomy. So Turkey is fine with, for instance, the Iraqi Kurds to have some form of limited autonomy, but not, uh, not when that means when they go for full independence. That's why they were very against this independence referendum. And now there was a map that was published uh, recently. Um, and there you can see all the Turkish bases in the Kurdistan region. Um, I think there are less bases than this, but this was a map that published by a Turkish uh, official government account and later deleted. And you see that the Turkish expansion is, is increasing. And like, it's, it's really the, the case, like if it's really about just the PKK, because for instance, during the Mosul operation, Turkey really tried to get involved also in Mosul. They wanted to have a say there. And um, that's why you see there's a, a military base in Bashika but Iraq didn't allow them. So Turkey has territorial ambitions both in, in, in Syria and, and Iraq, and they, they want to contain uh, Kurdish autonomy. And that's why also I was talking about the attempt by Turkey to open uh, alternative border crossing. Uh, so you can see on the left side of the... So what they wanted to do there is was controlling like the would control that. Uh, then they could make a, a pipeline going pipeline 
going directly from Baghdad to Turkey. And in that case, uh, Turkey wouldn't need the KRG anymore. But because of the US, I think it was stopped because also the US, uh, they needed this because uh, the Fischhabur, the Samarka border crossing is the direct line uh, that the US is supplying the SDF with uh, logistical support. So the US, I think they were opposed to this. And also I think the Peshmerga at, uh, at that time, they resisted the Iraqis from going to contain uh, Kurdish autonomy in the region. I also wanted to say something about Iran uh, because there's not so much focus on Kurds uh, in Iran. Um, there was a ceasefire between uh, Pejok and, and Iran in 2011. And also Iran opposed the uh, independence referendum in 2017. And in 2016, the PDKI, uh, the party of, um, uh, led by Mustafa Hijri, decided to resume the armed struggle. Uh, so they decided to do again armed attacks inside Iran. And the reason for that is because the Kurdish Iran, uh, Iranian Kurdish parties, they were basically exiled from Iran after they lost the battle after the Islamic revolution. They actually controlled for some time Kurdish areas in Iran, but they lost the battle. And from that time, like Iranian Kurdish parties were mostly based in the Kurdistan region. Uh, before actually there was an official Kurdistan region. And so these Kurdish parties, the PDKI, but also Kamal and other parties, they have their bases uh, close to the border. Uh, but the result of that, I think, was that Iran basically tested ballistic missiles on the reigning Kurdish parties, both on the PDKI and on the KDP. I'm not talking about Barzani's KDP, but another KDP party. Um, and also they executed three Kurdish activists and also attacked uh, three uh, Pejak leaders and they killed like two leaders of Pejak all at the same day. And um, so Iran still doesn't want also Iranian Kurdish parties to operate from the Kurdistan region. And also Iran, when, when Iranian Kurdish parties offered support to the Kurdistan region, to the Peshmerga to help with them, to help them with the fight against ISIS, Iran actually actively opposed that. So for instance, when the Iranian Kurdish, Kurdish fighters were helping the Peshmerga in Mahmur, Iran actually actively pressured the Kurdistan region and the Kurdish parties to not allow Iranian Kurdish parties to, to participate. Although there was one smaller Kurdish party uh, that until the end uh, helped the, the Iraqi Kurds to fight against ISIS, it's called PAK, which is a smaller Kurdish party. And also there were still assassination attempts against Iranian Kurdish party uh, leaders in the Kurdistan region. But the Iranian ambitions also are not only in, in pressuring the Kurdistan region from not allowing Iranian Kurds to operate there, but even recently in Holland, there was an Iranian Kurdish politician was stabbed, and there's a very high likelihood that Iran was behind this attack. And that also goes back to the tradition that uh, several uh, senior Kurdish leaders, uh, Qasim Lo and Sharaf Khamdi, they were basically killed in Europe without Europe doing much against this. And although that the Trump administration is so much against the Iranian regime, you don't see so much uh, the, the US administration talking about Kurds being executed. For instance, recently Trump uh, tweeted about some Iranians that were threatened to be executed because they were involved in a protest, but he didn't talk about some Kurds that were recently executed uh, in Iran. And like also recently there was a Kurdish language uh, teacher that was imprisoned for 10 years. So the Kurds in Iran, they faced executions, assassinations, and also imprisonment. And there's no, I don't think in the near future, also not under the Trump administration or future administration, I don't think there's a much uh, future for the Iranian Kurds, unless there will be like a huge change in Iran itself, like internal chaos, something what happened like, for instance, during the Islamic revolution. So as I said, the Turkish ambitions are not just limited to the PKK. So I think if you just look to the statements of Erdogan that he says he doesn't want to repeat the same scenario what happened in North Iraq and Northern Syria, that is not related to the PKK, but it's about the Kurds. And I think that in a possible in the future, I think maybe this year or next year, there's always a possibility that Turkey could attack again in, in, in Rojava. And Turkey is also active with, actively carrying out ground operations uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan. And we can also see that in the future, they could even expand this role with ground operations. Maybe even they want to do something in Sinjar. They're also bombing Mahmur. So we can see more of that and there will be more civilian uh, casualties. And um, about the Kurds in Iran, I think there's a very limited chance for the Kurds of Iran to have any opportunity for more rights, because unless there's like a big uh, Iranian regime change or instability in Iran, I don't see like US forces supporting the Kurds in Iran. And until now, you even see like the US not really so much talking to the Iranian Kurdish opposition, although they have like a major uh, support base inside Iran. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Willingberg, uh, for your remark. Great remark. Thank you very much. First question uh, to our uh, first uh, guest who talked, uh, uh, Her Excellency uh, Ben Khan. What do Kurds want, and how should they navigate through this? And what KRG USA WC currently represent Kurds, and ask the U.S. government to help in this conflict? Uh, thank you very much for that question. And uh, it's good to see that uh, Dr. Ibrahim Saleh will be speaking. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge Sinam Khan. I saw her name in the list of participants. Um, so good, good to see her there too. Uh, shall I continue? My screen has gone blank, so I don't know. No, I hear you. You are okay. Okay, all right. So uh, the question is, what is the KRG US representation doing here in Washington uh, about all of these various issues? Well, as I said, not every, everything that we do uh, can be tweeted about or written up in a press release. Um, our focus, of course, is Iraqi Kurdistan. Officially, uh, the mission, the representation, rep represents the Kurdistan regional government. Uh, we do not uh, represent any other Kurds or Kurdish organization. So we have to be very mindful of that and mindful of our status here. However, it is true that uh, we are linked by blood, by history, by culture, uh, by so many things. In my own family, my husband is from uh, Roj Halat, uh, from Iranian Kurdistan. So, uh, of course, what happens in Turkey, what happens in Syria and in Iran impacts us, uh, even as just representing Kurdistan region in Iraq. What happens in our neighborhood impacts us. And of course, yes, we do talk about that with the State Department, with the White House, with the DOD, and critically with members of Congress <coughs> who also uh, are very interested and often have questions for us, even if... I don't go into a meeting with my own agenda. They will be asking me, what do you think is happening in Turkey? What is Turkey trying to do in Syria and so on? So those issues do come up and we try to share our views, our concerns with our friends here in America. And I think we, we should acknowledge what the United States has been doing. Uh, the United States intervened when ISIS was attacking Sinjar. Uh, it intervened when ISIS was attacking Erbil, and we should thank the United States for that. It also finally intervened once it was clear that the Kurds were fighting back in Kobani. And that, of course, the, the U.S. intervention changed everything for us in Iraqi Kurdistan. It changed everything for our brethren in Syria, and I think we should all acknowledge that. Uh, there may be disagreements here and there, we may see shortcomings, they may sh see shortcomings in what we do, but we are in fact allied with the United States, with a coalition, and that is something that we should acknowledge. Um, there were one or two things, if I may, that were brought up in the chat. I just want to address them and I will be very, very quick. Um, somebody said, I thought it was Vladimir, but I, I was told that it wasn't Vladimir, but somebody said that the biggest obstacle is that there is no international recognition of the Kurdish people. Yes, that's true. We don't have a sovereign state and, and the whole international setup is around the sovereign state. Uh, so, you know, they will talk to Baghdad and if we're lucky, they will then talk to the KRG and so on. That is the reality. But things are changing. The Kurdistan region in Iraq does have a status that is recognized around the world. We have representations in 14 countries. There are 35 or 36 consulates and embassy offices in the Kurdistan region. And uh, the Irish gentleman who said in the chat that the Kurds should focus on small countries as well. Absolutely, we do that. We talk to uh, as many countries as we can. But if you're, if you're meaning that we should establish rep more representations abroad, it's very expensive for us to do that. So this is why we have a limited number of representations. A lot of the staff and the representatives are from the diaspora. 
Um, for, there are many good reasons for that. It means that those people know those, know those countries very well. But there's also a cost element, an expense element. But we absolutely do reach out to as many countries as we can. Uh, here in Washington, I meet with ambassadors and diplomats from every country that has an embassy here in Washington. We go to the UN and New York as frequently as we can. So we reach out to as many people as, as we can. I think uh, one final point is really the role of the diaspora. I go back to that. The diaspora is important. In the US and Canada, our numbers are small, but in Europe, a million Kurds. In Germany, half a million, maybe more Kurds. You have a voice, so please use it. I will stop there because uh, I don't want to hog all the time. Happy to take more questions Thank later you. on. Thank you. My next uh, question is going to be uh, for Dr. Pollock. Dr. Pollock is uh, and one of the friends, uh, audience uh, asking, uh, Mr. Ahmad Zada, I think from, uh, he's from San Diego. So asking, what can be done to stop Turkey's excuse of using the PKK in attacking the Kurds everywhere? It seems that the biggest beneficiary of the PKK, of PKK is Turkey and biggest victims to be the Kurds? Yeah, uh, it, it's a great question and um, I appreciate it. I, I wish I had a clear answer to it, um, but I will say that, uh, first of all, it is the responsibility, I think, of the other governments in the region to um, protest and prevent, if possible, Turkish military incursions for whatever reason or under whatever excuse into their territory. So it's first of all the responsibility of the Iraqi government to um, maintain its own sovereignty and territorial integrity and to uh, convince Turkey that it needs to stop its military incursions into Iraqi territory. And um, I think that this is something that in reality is very difficult for a relatively weak Iraqi government and security force to do, but uh, there's more that they could do. Um, and that would be, I think, the single most uh, significant step because the United States and other countries, I think, are more uh, receptive to uh, more, let's say, optimistic about, or at least um, willing to take more of a chance in supporting the current Iraqi government than they were until very recently. This Iraqi government seems to be more serious, more friendly to the West, and more inclined to um, protect its own sovereignty against outside interference, whether from Iran or from Turkey. And so if the Iraqi government is willing more than in the past to uh, step up to this challenge and tell the Turks that they need to get out and, and or at least to stop coming in, then uh, that would be, I think, the most important single uh, answer to your very good question. Thank you. Uh, again, I uh, have a, the next question uh, from uh, Khanam Sina Muhammad uh, to Mr. William. Uh, Mr. William, uh, Mr. Ms. Sinam asked, so what should the Kurds do to make their voice heard? Um, so what can the, do, the Kurds do to get their voice heard? Well, we saw recently, for instance, when uh, Turkey um, uh, was bombing near civilians and killed some civilians in the Kurdistan region. You saw a lot of people, on, like young Kurdish people on social media, sharing this and trying to get attention for that. And you also saw that during the attack on Kobani that a lot of Kurds mobilized with protests and on Twitter, uh, also giving attention to human rights abuses. And we also saw that again in October 2019 when Turkey attacked Tel Abiyat and Serekania that there was actually a lot of media attention for this specific uh, episode that Turkey attacked. And I think the reason for that also because there was such like a large community mobilized and they were 
writing emails to their representatives in different countries in the US and Europe, Australia. They were putting pressure on their own rep representatives. So I think, as Bayan Khan also said, that the Kurdish diaspora has a, lot, a large role because every time when Turkey launches this kind of interventions, and especially if, if uh, civilians get killed, there could be like more attention to that uh, with, for instance, uh, attention to human rights abuses. And we see, for instance, uh, one of the issues in Afrin and Serekania and Tel Abyad is that there's a lot of human rights abuses, but often we don't see those because nobody cares about that. I mean, the media always focus on the Syrian regime, which is of course true, the Syrian regime, they killed a lot of people, the most people in, in the whole conflict. But for instance, there's a lot of human rights abuses, kidnapping of women, uh, kidnapping of civilians, but uh, there's not so lot, much media focus on that. So if the Syrian Kurds, for instance, wants to bring more focus on that, then they should focus more uh, in a professional way to bring this to the attention. So to doc document media uh, human rights abuses and email this to the media, to Congress persons, to institutions that are busy with human rights abuses. And sadly, like it's still uh, limited because there are so many human rights abuses in, in these areas on the Turkish control, but there's not so much attention for that. So I think the Kurds could do more of that to organize it on that and try to bring more attention to these issues. But it's also very difficult because, for instance, every journalist can go to the northeast of Syria. For instance, Amnesty can go to Raqqa and like make a report about bombings in, uh, in Raqqa by the US. But for instance, the Amnesty cannot go to Afrin and do like a report about human rights abuses there. So I think um, there's challenges because the Turkish controlled areas are not so much uh, accessible to uh, human rights organizations or journalists. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, there's a question for Mr. Gran. Uh, Mr. Gran, uh, we all remember, uh, and you went into history, so we're going to go back a little bit into history. Uh, if we remember uh, the Hamidi cavalry, I was called in Arabic, for some Hamidin. Uh, Ottoman, uh, Ottoman Empire used those uh, to uh, exterminate uh, the non-Muslim, as in Armenian and uh, so Greek, uh, if you remember, the, uh, we read about that uh, history. So are we are seeing similarly now uh, those like uh, extremist fraction in Syria that were created by Erdogan's uh, or by Ekber party or Turkish state, are we going to see this similar and uh, those those they going to attack so exterminate so their focus going to be the Kurds so uh, because the, their conflict the Turkish conflict was just now with the Kurds are we, are the history going to repeat itself? I would argue that. The, the, the Turkish state has never seized that policy, has never terminated that policy of using Kurds against Kurds, um, not just other minorities. But, for example, we have uh, in Turkey 90,000 village guards who are employed by the Turkish state to fight against other Kurds. Um, so I would say that that's an updated version of the Hamidiya. Actually, I don't know the English name for those as well, maybe. Um, but yeah, so uh, I don't think that that's ever ended. And in, in Syria as well, we, we see Kurdish organizations who are almost completely sponsored by the Turkish state, uh, who are there in Afrin even, where uh, both the Turkish army itself and factions that are supported by the Turkish state are raping uh, Kurdish women, are taking them hostage, are, are you know, are, are, are stealing their properties, uh, you know, a lot of things that are sponsored by the Turkish state, and yet you can find certain Kurds who, who don't mind uh, working alongside these very uh, people. So I don't think that that's ever terminated, and yes, the Turkish state would still like to do that. And it is still doing that. Now, there's also a question in the uh, discussion section that I wanted to answer specifically about the HDP. Uh, someone's asked about the HDP's policy as being a party for Turkey, um, and it's not necessarily a Kurdish party. Now, uh, first and foremost, both I um, and I would say the majority of the people in my party believe in the principle that every nation has the right to self-determination. Um, and that includes, definitely includes the Kurdish people. Now, Bayan Khan talked about regional dynamics and how uh, the Kurdistan regional government itself, although it's internationally recognized, uh, and as Bayan Khan said, represented in many different countries, 
uh, even they have to be sensitive to the regional dynamics and countries like Iran and, and Turkey who are you know, almost hell-bent on, on trying to eradicate anything Kurdish in the region. So in a, in a world or in, in, a, in a region where the Kurdistan regional government with all this international uh, recognition has to be sensitive, the Kurds of Turkey have to be extra sensitive. We, we, I mean, we have nothing internationally. Um, although we are you know, close to 20 million, around 20 million Kurds in Turkey, we have nothing. So for us to fight for democracy in Turkey is a prior, it's a matter of life and death. For us Kurds in Turkey to fight for the democratization of Turkey is a matter of life and death for us. And I would argue in other countries, I mean, for example, in Iraq, we have a Kurdistan regional government that's at least able to have a political dispute with Baghdad. Um, I mean, you know, political disputes didn't exist with Saddam. So the democratization or the relative democratization of Iraq has enabled the Kurds of Iraq to at least have political disputes. Now, we're not, we're not at that level yet. So we have to, as a matter of life and death, fight for democracy in Turkey before we can speak about other things, or at least do it together. I mean, the people of Scotland can only have a referendum because the UK is a democratic country that doesn't want to commit genocide every time Scottish people say that they want independence. And I think at the very least, we need to be able to fight for this in Turkey. At the end of the day, we live with these people as well. And self-determination is not just about building barbed wire fences uh, on, uh, you know, and cutting yourself off from other people. That's not the only way you can determine yourself uh, or your own destiny. There are other options as well. And I would argue that with the current dynamics in the region, the Kurds are in every single part, in every single part of Kurdistan, are looking for options which first and foremost ensure the safety and security of the Kurds. And then, uh, then we can start talking about other forms of political expression and articulation of uh, self-determination. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Uh, Dr. David, back to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, once President Abraham Lincoln said, house divided can't stand. Right. Also, Professor Brendan Allery stated, it's your friend. Kurdish internal divisions are pathological. <laughs> And that makes it easy to govern them and prevent them to obtain their rights. Right. As uh, a statement from Professor Olavi. Yeah. So we would like to have your opinion on that and how currently can be treated. Yeah. Well, I, I think it is true the intra-Kurdish internal Kurdish divisions among Kurds in different countries and within any one country have been a great source of weakness uh, for the Kurdish cause and the Kurdish people. Um, and at the same time, I think that the reality of the last century and the next century, at least as I foresee it, is that the idea of pan-Kurdish unity, unity of all Kurds in all of these countries, is not realistic. So my own view is that the Kurds in each one of these countries, the four countries that we've been talking about, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and Syria, where most of the region's Kurds live, most of the Kurds in the world live, uh, the Kurds in each one of those countries should focus on unity with each other inside that country before they think about bigger unity with Kurds in other countries. And to be more specific, because other people also asked about this, and I'll try to be very brief. In, in Iraq, it, there's no doubt that the divisions between the KDP and the PUK contributed to the loss of Kirkuk in, after the referendum of 2017. It was mostly a military defeat that uh, I think uh, would, would have been very hard to avoid. But I think also the internal Kurdish divisions uh, contributed to the severity and the speed of that defeat and the unwillingness of any outside powers, including the United States, to consider uh, trying to, to stop it. 
there's no doubt that in Syria, the divisions between the PYD and the KNC are a serious point of leverage or uh, let's say disruption that Turkey can take advantage of and, and does try to take advantage of, uh, as Giran mentioned, um, by putting, pitting some Kurds against other Kurds. So my first recommendation would be, and, and this is basically the, the point that I want to leave you with, is, is that the Kurds in Iraq should focus on combining their efforts with each other in a constructive and peaceful way. And the Kurds in Syria should do the same. And let's leave aside for right now the issues of Iraqi Kurds uniting with Syrian Kurds or with Turkish Kurds or with Iranian Kurds. The, these issues realistically, I think, need to be addressed first on a national level. And there is a serious effort that the United States is supporting right now to get the Syrian Kurds, at least, to reconcile some of their internal differences between the PYD and the KNC. And not surprisingly, the Turks are bitterly opposed to that. <laughs> and to me, that's a signal, a clear signal that, of where Turkey's priorities are. They're not, the Turks are not very interested in fighting against ISIS or in fighting against Assad or in doing anything except fighting against the Kurds and dividing the Kurds from each other in Syria, if they can. But in my judgment, there's, a, there's a, a real opportunity for the Kurds in Syria to take the first step on this road toward unity by reconciling the PYD with other Kurdish parties and organizations and communities, at least in the framework of northeastern Syria. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, we are running over, uh, out of our time, but again, I have a last question for Mr. Uh, Vladimir or uh, Prelast. I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll see uh, how it would take, how many time it take. So, uh, Mr. Vladimir, uh, since you are on the ground and uh, close to the scene, how do you describe to our viewers the real targets of the church of this violation and incursion into neighboring countries? And what the civilian response in both Western and Southern Kurdistan to Turkey attack? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the difference, the, the, there's a, there are some differences between uh, Iraqi Kurdistan and, uh, and Rojava or Northern Syria. Because uh, in northern Syria and Rojava, the threat of the Turkish attack is basically if they are gonna, if they are allowed to attack that large border strip, then basically the Kurds in Syria have no more future. Because we saw what happened in Afrin, like most of the Kurds were displaced. There are still some elderly Kurds living there. And then if you look to Tel Abyab, there is no more Kurds there. In Ras Alai, most of the Kurds uh, left. And if Turkey will do such an invasion again, then basically it will try to settle Syrians there from non-Kurdish areas. And then I think the future demographically speaking for Rojavad will be very difficult uh, for there to see still like a, a future presence, like a viable Kurdish presence there. And that's a little bit different for Iraqi Kurdistan because like in Iraqi Kurdistan, like the, the fighting is mostly taking place in like um, areas on the border. So some of them are like empty and some of them are populated. So there's also a lot of large villages are depopulated, especially like around Zohko. There's some Christian and Kurdish villages that fled because of the fighting. Uh, but in general, like I think it's a little bit different because you don't have this huge demographic uh, change uh, different. There's not like Turkey invading Erbil or Slemanyu Duhok and then threatening to place Arabs or Turkmen there. That's like the biggest difference. But in both sides, civilians get hurt. Like Turkey always saying, no, we never targeted civilians. But for instance, uh, Air Wars, it's an online website tracking Turkish airstrikes. You see every time that civilians get hit. And for instance, even one time in Sinjar, they killed uh, Peshmerga. And often you see actually that non-duty active, non-duty, uh, non non-active duty Peshmergas are getting killed in Turkish airstrikes uh, in these areas. Um, so I think that's a little bit of difference. Uh, and that's why there's, a, for instance, a much huger outcry about if Turkey invades Rojava 
uh, because it's seen as like a general attack on the Kurds and there's much more media attention from it. But if like they attack these remote areas on the border with, Tur uh, with, um, with Turkey, like you mostly only get media attention when there, for instance, is a Turkish airstrike near those tourist, uh, touristic area or civilians get hit. But in general, there's not so much media attention for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, one uh, quick answer we will uh, need from uh, uh, Ms. Abdurrahman Bayan Khan. Uh, the last question. Uh, Turks uh, deploying their military and creating bases on Iraq soil. However, based on Article 21 of the Iraqi Constitution, KRG can veto and modify any military deployment on its soil. Uh, if you're talking about the Iraqi constitution, there are so many articles that have been uh, neglected or have been actually crushed and opposed and the opposite of what is required in the Iraqi constitution has been done. So, um, yes, of course we don't want uh, any of the neighboring countries to encroach any further into Iraqi Kurdistan, and we would in fact like them to not be there at all. But what can we do as a regional government, uh, not a sovereign state, what can we do with our force size compared to the forces of our neighboring countries? Uh, and we, I referred earlier to their, to their powers. And what can we do when our sovereign state, Iraq, Baghdad, doesn't act either because it doesn't want to or maybe it cannot. If you look at Iraq today, Iraq is not really um, a fully sovereign state. We have interference in Iraqi affairs, whether some Iraqis are willing to have that and some are not. But the result is that Iraq has a lot of regional powers and even non-regional powers uh, playing, uh, playing out their proxy games and proxy uh, rivalries and sometimes even conflicts on Iraqi territory. So I think what we would really need is for Iraq to be able to stand up as a sovereign state, to become stronger economically, uh, and to become stronger as a democracy, referring back to what the Kagiran was saying earlier. We need Iraqi, uh, the Iraq Iraq to be sovereign, to be democratic, to respect the constitution that was ratified back in 2005, to respect Kurdish rights and Kurdish authorities, and to allow that state to stand up and therefore uh, not to allow all of these incursions and erosion of Iraqi sovereignty. And that includes Kurdish sovereignty within Iraq. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Ms. Uh, Abdurrahman. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, I think that is all the time we have for today, even we uh, went over 10 minutes. Uh, let's together thanks our speakers for giving us their time today and lending us their expertise. We also want to thank our attendees for tuning in today. And again, please check us on uh, check, uh, check us out uh, on Twitter, KNC underscore NA, like us on Facebook, and go to our web, kncma.org, to learn more about uh, Kurdistan National Congress of North America. Thank you all for joining us.